There we go. There you go. All right, so many of you probably know, but there's plenty of times when in conversations I finally realize that someone's talking about salt marsh grass or they're talking about seaweed when I'm talking about seagrass. So not salt marsh, not seaweed, rooted, vascular, flowering, marine plant, submerged in coastal waters. Um, and Zasta marina is known as eelgrass. That's the dominant metal forming eelgrass in the Northeast, and that's what we have here in New York. Um, so why do we care? And it comes down to this term that's being more, used more and more often, ecosystem services. And um, it's been known for a while that it supports an abundance of uh, sea life, but we're learning more and more about how it supports coastal environmental quality and resilience. And let's take a little closer look. Um, it is federally designated as essential fish habitat. Why? Because commercial, recreational, and ecologically important species utilize seagrass beds. And they perform a lot of habitat functions in terms of spawning, nursery, foraging, grazing, refuge, and corridor. And these are just examples of some of the groups in New York that benefit from it, from little fish that are important in the food chain to well-known for scallop habitat, but also things like uh, fluke and striped bass and black sea, uh, black sea bass and blackfish, and some more interesting and rare and special, uh, some transient sea turtles and resonant seahorses. Other seagrass services, it's a highly productive habitat, and they, uh, in that process of being highly productive, they oxygenate the sea bottom, um, their physical structure reduces wave energy, it baffles currents, and particles settle out, and that sedimentation process is uh, reinforced by stabilization of the seabed by the roots, and this all goes to uh, stabilizing the shoreline from erosion. And they also play an important role, and we're learning more about this um, as we speak in terms of studies are being conducted now in the realm of what they call blue carbon and uh, sequestering carbon and storing it. They do it as well as a forest, if not better, because the anoxic sediment actually seals it off from organic matter degradation. So benefits to society, and we're learning more about that. Here's one that came out just last year, a study uh, in Indonesia, and they were looking at coral reef and coral disease. And they noticed the pattern of when seagrass was in between the islands and the reefs, the coral reefs were much healthier, much lower incidence of disease. And um, they discovered that these seagrasses are helping reduce the pathogen load, probably one in the, the settling of the particles that are coming off the land, but there's also likely antimicrobial properties inherent in the seagrass communities. They, they need to study more on those mechanisms, but just another role, another benefit. What's the problem? Seagrass uh, sea is declining around the globe. One estimate is about 7% loss per year. Uh, there's a group called Project Seagrass in the UK that calls it um, every hour about two football fields are being lost. In New York, uh, there was a historic estimate done for the time period of around 1930, and they say there was about 200,000 acres. Um, in 2000, there was about 21,000 acres. So the number that gets thrown around is about 10%. And, well, 2000, what is it, 2018 now? Uh, it's likely less than that now. Um, the, a recent assessment in Long Island Sound in 2012 had about 421 acres in the New York portion of Long Island Sound. And 96% of that is around Fisher's Island. I'll just let you know, one of the nicest days I've had on my job was drifting through the eelgrass in Fisher's Island one day in August a year ago. Beautiful habitat, all sorts of fish swimming around. So if you get a chance to do that, if you like that kind of thing, that is the place to do it. Okay, um, in the Beconic Estuary, there was a, a historical assessment for 1930s. That's all the blue, not there anymore. Red is for 2000, that's about 1,500 acres, a little over and an assessment that was done in 2014, less than 1,000 acres. So we lost about a third from 2000 to 2014. The South Shore Estuary Reserve is, a coast, is an estuary program by New York State Department of State. 
uh, they had an assessment done in 2002, 20,000 acres. So compared to the other ones, where it was you know, 400, 1,000, 20,000, so a lot more seagrass down here. Problem is, that assessment's from 2002. Well, how's it doing now? Uh, traditionally, the mapping is done through aerial photography from fixed-wing uh, aircraft. And uh, this has been important for environmental planning for multiple reasons. Uh, a lot of places have utilized it in water quality planning. I'll talk more about that. Uh, but just also permitting uh, big projects as well. <clears throat> so I was assisting folks from the uh, Department of State in trying to get aerials flown last year. And boom, brown tide. Uh, big one in the South Shore last year. It lasted a long time. And you can imagine if you have to take pictures from an aircraft to see through the water to the bottom, that's a problem, okay? Not only is it a problem for the imagery, but it's also a problem for the seagrass too because it cuts the light that the plant is receiving. That light is really important for its survival. Um, so because of this decline, in 2006, there was a task force that was created for recommendations on restoring, preserving, and managing seagrass in New York. They had an experts meeting in 2007. Um, they had local people, but they also brought in national experts from other parts of the country to help uh, develop a foundation of understanding. What are the trends here and in other places? What are the issues here? What do we need to do in terms of, of um, actions? And, and gather more information was a big part of it. And this led to the development of a Seagrass Task Force report to the governor and legislature in 2009. And this supported the uh, passage of the Seagrass Protection Act, which is New York State Conservation Vi uh, uh, Environmental Law. And uh, one of the biggest provisions was develop and adopt, with consultation of stakeholders, seagrass management plans for designated areas to protect the seagrass, but also to preserve traditional recreational activities. So you know, preserve the, the lifestyle of our coastal communities, but also protect the resource, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, just want to let you know, uh, developing, I've been developing seagrass management pages, and they have links to the Protection Act and that Seagrass Task Force report, as well as, this is like fresh, brand new, um, just came out this week, we integrated the three different estuary programs, their maps, into one map for New York State. And this is uh, an online viewer. There's a link on that page now, so you can go and access it as the public and have an interactive map to so check out where these areas are. Also, uh, when I go out to check out different areas to make assessments, to understand how's the seagrass here, what are the impacts, uh, I try to take video. And these are some of those videos from what I consider some of the best remaining examples of seagrass around New York water. So parts of Great South Bay, Fishers Island, Shelter Island. One of the directives that came out of uh, the task force work was this idea of uh, localized planning. Uh, they wanted to see a different approach. A lot of times when it comes to state environmental management. Regulations are made in Albany and then handed down. And they wanted to see a different approach to work with communities and municipalities to try to understand the resource there and understand the issues there and maybe develop the planning upwards and see how uh, that can be developed. And they considered that would likely be more effective. Another thing that was um, consensus was that conservation is more effective than restoration. And a big part of that is that the requirements to recolonize seagrass, the environmental conditions needed, is a lot greater than it is to maintain seagrass. A lot of that has to do with the meadow itself has you know, positive feedback loops, self-preserving qualities. This has to do with water flow and sedimentation, but also a lot of it has to do with is resilience from the below ground biomass. The roots and rhizomes are where it stores its energy. So the tough times of the year, like say high temperature in the summertime, it relies on that energy to help get through. Um, also the oxygen that it creates helps create an environment that is healthier for the plant as opposed to sulfur compounds building up and becoming toxic. Um, in general, restoration, it's not cheap and the success rate is pretty low. And not just in New York is the success rate low, but in, globally the success rate's pretty low. So 
a big part of what I do for my work is try to think about what will help preserve seagrass. And a perspective I have from uh, my graduate work in marine disease ecology is if you can reduce the total amount of stress, the total threats, the resilience of the organism should improve. So what are the threats? Water quality is by far the lead. It's the lead in other areas. It's a lead issue that's identified in the task force report. That's related mostly to reduced light and turbidity, which can be tied back to eutrophication, which is related to uh, excessive algal growth. Another issue is climate warming, but that's kind of a, a tough nut to crack. Um, and another main issue is physical impacts. So take a little closer look at some of these things, water quality. Uh, this is related to nutrient pollution, um, things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen is considered more of an issue in marine and coastal phosphorus, more fresh water, but acting like a fertilizer, excessive growth of algae, eutrophication from multiple sources, depending on the area that you're looking at. Some might be more runoff, some might be more septic, some might be more uh, agricultural sources. Here is the general progression of nutrients. Not enough nutrients, and the grass is not going to do that well. It needs it. Here you have a nice combination of light and nutrients. It's growing well. It's healthy. You start to get more nutrients, and you have macroalgae and seaweed out competing, and it starts to grow on top of it and reducing the light that the plant gets. Then you get even more, and that productivity dynamic shifts more into the plankton community, and you have high phytoplankton growth, which cuts out the light from the surface. And then that's when you really can start losing seagrass, because they don't get enough light to survive. Seagrass need about 20 to 30 percent of the surface light. So people are familiar with terrestrial plants. They don't need nearly that much light to do well. Algae can get by on a fraction of that. So a very high light requirement. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's a plant that lives submerged in salt water. It's a tough environment. So it balances that by being highly productive. If you combine the issue of reduced clarity, which is essentially reduces the energy that the plant has, with increasing temperature, which increases the metabolism, you get respiratory exhaustion. And I equate it to if you were going to train for a marathon but decided to starve yourself in preparation for that marathon, what's going to happen? You're going to collapse. And that's what's happening with seagrass. It's burning out. So seagrass is used as the gold standard of marine habitat and water quality relationships. And it's been utilized for criteria to manage water quality in, in other regions. And there's a current planning process known as the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, which involves the state, Nassau, and Suffolk County. And they're going to need ecological endpoints or biological references, understanding, okay, wh the water quality relationships, how is that affecting the biological community? And seagrass is, is likely going to be an indicator in that process. And there's good stories and good examples of these relationships out there. This is Tampa Bay. This is an assessment of seagrass in 1950. In the 70s, their seagrass really started to tank. Uh, their bays were getting choked, a lot of it by macroalgae and seaweed. Um, some pretty gross pictures of the, of the conditions at that time. They started to implement monitoring. They started to implement nutrient uh, uh, pollution control regimes. And over, mm, let's see, about 30 years, or 2018 now, they've had a massive recovery in seagrass. And the values after 2014 have actually passed this 1950 value. So lots of monitoring, lots of implementation, but there's a good story. In the Chesapeake Bay, they've been uh, conducting monitoring to gather data to support a model of understanding relationship of phytoplankton, nutrients, and seagrass health, and light properties. And again, over about 30 years, there's now a good story to tell in terms of 
the nutrient reductions leading to a recovery. And the recovery that they're talking about here is of submerged aquatic vegetation. They have other grasses besides Zostra too, a lot of freshwater grasses as well. Um, but a lot of lessons to be learned here, and there's an opportunity to implement such things here. One of the problems, we do not have the luxury of that kind of data here. So we're trying to get at information that's really going to help us get to that kind of approach. Uh, these are bio-optical studies that are being conducted now. One of them uh, is happening in the Peconic Estuary, uh, being conducted by uh, Professor Peterson's lab at Stony Brook. And um, we also uh, are supporting a similar study in Great South Bay. So it's going to be interesting to see the results that come out of this work and also to be able to compare the two systems. So water quality is a big issue and needs multiple levels of, of, of um, interaction to order to tackle it. What can you do on a more local level? And I think that's going to involve some watershed planning, but really also looking at what kind of physical disturbances that are happening there. And I'm going to take a little closer look at that. So what is manageable? That's the question. Uh, and so you've got to take a look at what are the impacts in these areas. And often, hardened shorelines come up. And uh, I can understand coastal property owners. You have something like Hurricane Sandy come through. What is your reaction? I'm going to put down concrete and rock and make sure my you know, property doesn't wash into the sea. I can understand that impulse. But when you do this, you change the shape of your shoreline, and you have a trade-off. You lose coastal habitat. And part of that shallow habitat that lost is where seagrass would be. There are other ways to go about it, and they're starting to try these different techniques that incorporate natural features. And this is an example of a big project that's happened recently uh, in Shinnecock Bay uh, by Cornell Cooperative. And they've used salt marsh grass, a beach grass, and uh, a variation of techniques to create more of a natural <coughs> featured shoreline. Uh, there was a recent guidance document released last year about living shoreline techniques for the Marine District of New York that talks about these kinds of things. Here's an issue that our New England neighbors have uh, started to tackle. And uh, you can see here some boats and some moorings. And this is a big seagrass area and see some bare patches associated with the mooring. What's happening here is you're getting scour circles from the mooring chains. So traditional moorings have a, a big mushroom weight anchor heavy chain down here and a chain that goes up here to the float. As the boat shifts in the tide and in the wind, the boat kind of goes around in a circle during the course of the day. And that's where these scour circles are coming from. Here is an eelgrass meadow in Cockles Harbor in Shelter Island. It's one of the last remaining seagrass meadows in any harbor in New York and the most substantial one left in any harbor in New York. I know that there's a mooring field here. So I started to think, hmm, is there evidence of this kind of impact happening there? I tried to look. Yeah, you probably can't see this. It's kind of faint. All right, there's a little bit of a checkerboard area here. And I was like, yeah, I can kind of see it, but this is not that great. Is there a better way for me to get an image, an evidence of this happening? Because in order to try to make a change, if you don't show people that there's an impact, it's not going to work. So I found out that uh, New York State law enforcement has a drone program. I was able to work with them uh, and get a flight over Cockles Harbor uh, in November after the mooring season just this past year. And this is what we got. This is the mooring field. I think we have evidence of our impact. So I brought this to a town board meeting on Shelter Island. And said, OK, maybe we could try to do something about this. And what is being done in some places in New England is that they're utilizing what they call a conservation mooring. And it utilizes elastic roads instead of chain and floating gear. So it stays up off the bottom. You're also utilizing a helix anchor, which sinks in and has a much smaller area of impact. And this is a study that was conducted comparing these different projects and applications. It's uh, pretty useful information. And there's also a group called the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat <coughs> Partnership. 
and they've supported some of these conservation mooring projects in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. And they're starting to see some good results in certain places. It's not great everywhere. It depends on the environmental conditions and the impact. But some places, it's working really well. And so I put together a project proposal to try to implement some of these moorings in Cockles Harbor. Another thing we may need to look at more closely, and I've looked at some aerial images, and I could see that it happens, but it's harder to tell in New York than in places like Florida, where this is a big issue. But just boating in general through shallow seagrass areas can cause impacts. So maybe doing something like this University of Florida education campaign to let people know just some basic practices to try to avoid these impacts. Uh, I can imagine in Great South Bay, uh, if we took a closer look, there's a lot of recreational boating and a lot of shallow water seagrass there. This is an example of um, utilizing prop wash from an outboard engine to harvest shellfish, things like soft shell clams and razor clams. I call it churning or easing or kicking. And these are tracks that have cut into the seagrass fields in eastern Shinnecock Bay. So this image was shared with me. And here's evidence, again, of another impact. And maybe, OK, is this area important enough for us to consider? Maybe we shouldn't allow this kind of practice in the seagrass bed. So it's something to, to think about. So besides water quality, what, what can we work on? Avoid and deter physical impacts. A starting point is utilizing those seagrass maps, but you know, to understand where the resource is, but also to understand the impacts, you might need some more observations and monitoring. So working on that, and we're going to need more of it. Um, again, some of the keys to those places that have done really well with their seagrass recovery is long-term uh, uh, data. Awareness and education, I think, is going to be important, too. A lot of people don't know what seagrass is, or if you tell them about it and they have it outside of their house, oh yeah, that's the stuff that gets caught in my jet ski. So trying to make them aware that it's really important, not just for fish habitat, because a lot of people do like to go fishing, so they can relate to that, but all these other environmental reasons. Uh, and then explore some protective measures. That's the issue when I'm trying to do outreach to stakeholders and municipal groups when the conversation gets uncomfortable. They don't like the idea of saying protective, you know. I think a lot of groups are used to the DEC trying to tell them what they can't do. I um, only want to explore what the locality is willing to try to do. I think if we give evidence of the impact, then maybe we can find a common ground to work with. It could be as simple as just something like this that was tried in Martha's Vineyard, where they just created a no anchor zone, and they provided some of those conservation moorings nearby for people to use. One idea that I've been kicking around is a protected area for seagrass and shellfish. I call it pass. You know, just give that area a pass. Leave it alone. Um, kind of akin to a, a coastal marine protected area, if you will. There's uh, support out there already for things like shellfish spawner sanctuaries. Maybe just expand upon that and have something like a, a coastal community natural heritage site. You know, something that, that's for our town and, and that's for our future. Um, in terms of observations, we could use more. And there's a lot of interest in citizen science, so we've developed a platform on Survey123 through ArcGIS. It's web-based and an app platform, so you can download it to your phone. There's a link for it through the Seagrass management pages. And you, you as citizens, can upload reports. Basically, you can pick a dot on a map, load a picture, answer a few questions, and that will show up on the map. And hopefully over time, if I get patterns of sort of descriptions or potential issues, that's something to follow up on and investigate. As a coordinator, I try to take advantage of opportunities for conservation and uh, to help the resource. And the breach at Fire Island Wilderness is an opportunity. Uh, it has improved water clarity in Bellport Bay. It's also improved the temperature. It's a little bit cooler. So improved clarity and cooler, that's good for seagrass. So we decided, and I'll show you who's we, to try to see if we could help aid the recovery of seagrass in this area. Uh, people, uh, folks from the town of Brookhaven, Nature Conservancy, 
uh, Professor Peterson's lab and his grad students, several of his grad students helped out. They were a big help. Uh, folks from DC and also folks from CTOC. And uh, this picture is at least someone from each one of those organizations. And they all actually happen to be Stony Brook graduates. We can't get away from them. <laughs> so we collected seeds uh, in early June. That happens to be the right time for some areas in the South Shore for the seeds. You only get about a few weeks when they're bearing seeds collected them, held on to them. The seeds dropped in tanks, and later that year in the fall, which is a good time to distribute seeds, we distributed seeds into the Bellport Bay area. Uh, this was something we utilized volunteers for, and we're gonna do that again this year. So if anyone's interested, uh, my email will be at the end, and you can help collect seagrass. Uh, I've addressed a lot of the major issues here, but um, one thing that uh, it hasn't really been addressed very well, and something that concerns me is the issue of herbicides and pesticides. There's been a little bit of work showing herbicides' direct influence on seagrass in terms of surface water or groundwater. I think the research was groundwater. Um, but there's also this issue of maybe pesticides on grazers. Algae and all sorts of stuff grows on seagrass, and you have animals that come and eat that stuff off of the seagrass to help keep the seagrass healthy. And there's recent evidence, oh, I think probably within a year or two, about a year and a half, that showed things like amphipods might actually help spread pollen around the seagrass meadows, very much analogous to like a bee does in terrestrial systems. So the impact that it might have on the sort of community of seagrass, I don't think we really have a good idea on that at all. Uh, so that's something that needs research in the future. Um, so at this point, uh, if you want further information, look up Seagrass Management, New York State DEC. Uh, that's my email address if you want to get in touch with me for anything, and uh, I appreciate your time. We actually have uh, plenty of time for questions, so. Um, my name is Daniel Carpin. I live in Lloyd Harbor, and in the late 50s and early 60s, I used to collect dead scallop shells along the south shore of Lloyd, of Lloyd Harbor. I was also told there was a lot of eel grass on the north shore, and about 1930, it all died for some reason. Could you collaborate on this? Uh, yeah, 1930s, there was uh, what they called a wasting disease event, and there's um, uh, a protist that is kind of like a slime mold uh, that was um, uh, caused uh, an epizootic. And, um, well, it shouldn't be zoo because it's animal. I used to do shellfish disease, so sorry. Um, but anyway, it uh, caused a big um, episode of uh, wasting disease, and it hit um, where we are, but it also hit uh, across the Atlantic. So it was up and down the, the east coast of the U.S. and also in the Atlantic. And that did some damage to eelgrass in a major portion of the globe. And uh, that, that's a well-known episode, that 1930s. Eelgrass rebounded after that. It took supposedly about mm, 20 years for it to rebound. It, we don't know if it came back quite to that 1930s level. Um, after it rebounded a bit, another big hit, uh, particularly for us in the Northeast, was uh, brown tides in the 80s, was another real knockback. And since then, it's come back a little bit, but not, I don't think it's so great. Do you ever think it'll come back to the North, eelgrass will be reestablished on the North Shore of Long Island, where supposedly it, it, it existed? Uh, so there's a couple of things to look at. I believe that if we can improve water clarity, there's, a, there's an amazing resilience in this plant to come back. But there's another issue of, it's not gonna come back everywhere it used to be because of temperature. Um, it, you know, it's more of a northern temperate. And when you get into the shallows, the water temperatures in the summertime are just higher than they ever used to be. So some places it may never come back. If we improve the water clarity, I think it has a, ch a chance to come back to a lot of places. The North Shore doesn't have, if you get into the bays and harbors, there's area there. When you get into Long Island Sound proper, it's hard because you get deep quick and you get deeper than the seagrass would be. So, you know, it has to do with depth, 
Um, but I think improved clarity should help substantially the ability for the plant to recover. Question, one of the, one how, of the how, deep, how deep can the water be before the eelgrass won't grow? It's all about clarity. Um, I know places that most places around Long Island doesn't get much deeper than eight feet. Fisher's Island, the clarity is great. It can get to like 20 feet. So, uh, you know, really has to do with clarity. Hey, thanks. My name is Peter. I live in uh, Center Mariches and enjoy snorkeling over by like the outer beach on the bay side of Smith Point. Like Great Gun, there's a Brookhaven Town Beach. You know that the area I'm talking about? Uh, oh, the, over in Mariches? Like across from Forge River to the east a little towards yeah, Mariches yeah, yep. Inlet? Yep, yep. And we, we actually collected uh, for the, the uh, seal, uh, eelgrass sea collection, we collected in the Mariches Bay and Narrows area, actually. Okay. The, um, a couple of years ago, I, like it was like from TV, I saw a you know, seed bay scallop like latched on to the blades of eelgrass in that area. And then just last year, like you can't even see green. Like all your pictures, like the one right there is beautiful. But what I, what I see is like brown macroalgae covering the eelgrass in recent years. Can you tell me what that, what that is likely and what causes that? If it's, I, obviously it's harmful, I guess, based on your slide with the, the macroalgae as you get further to the right with the nutrients. Um, but can you elaborate on, on what I might be seeing and what causes that? Um, it, I mean, you, get, you can get a range of different species that can be associated. You have things that will live directly on the grass. So you have the epiphyte algae, but then you have drift algae. And essentially the grass just provides something for the drift algae to get caught up in. And it can, it can start to, if it gets heavy, it can start to weigh it down. Um, so you have different combinations of, you know, what was the temperature that year? How's the water flow in that one particular area? Um, there were certain areas that were doing pretty good, but then when Hurricane Sandy came along, it like buried it in sand. And it's likely going to come back, but it's going to take a while. So it's going to shift some of the dynamics. And in certain places, you know, it can be year to year and it's not going to be the same. Some places are very consistent. So um, uh, I think... You know, it, it's definitely a variation of environmental conditions that can happen on an annual, on an annual basis. Okay, we'll go to the center. And then yeah, Bruce Horwith. I have a question for you on, uh, you showed an early slide that showed a remarkable recovery in Tampa Bay. Yes. And I was wondering if you know the factors responsible there and whether or not they're replicable here. Yes and no. <laughs> um, the process that they engaged in in Tampa Bay, I think if we utilize it here, I think there's a, a great potential for recovery. The same type of recovery, I don't think we can expect because um, they have six different species of seagrass in Tampa Bay. And so that allows the total seagrass habitat to cover a wider range of salinity and temperature tolerance. We have one dominant form. We also have rupia, but it, it's more of a, a lower salinity uh, grass, and it's not it's not as dominant as the eelgrass. So most of it is, is eelgrass here. So having that multi-species um, creates more resilience to the community. And that's something else that the Chesapeake has. Chesapeake has even more species. So that's something that they have going for them. But uh, by understanding the environmental conditions and the health of their seagrass and the monitoring and then the implementation as far as the nutrient reductions, I do believe we have uh, potential because there are cases of when things have improved in terms of water clarity and we have had seagrass rebound in New England and just across Long Island Sound and even parts of Great South Bay. Yeah, hi, John Turner, uh, steering committee with Lino and also with the SeaTac Environmental Association. You just partially answered the one question I had and that is about rapia or widgeon grass, how prevalent that is um, as a seagrass in New York waters. Um, and it's important. So I'd be curious to know if what, your, what your understanding of thoughts about that is. And then the other question I have, totally unrelated, is what uh, evidence is there uh, about uh, abandoned fishing equipment like, you know, crab pots and things scouring seagrass beds? Are they, uh, does that pose a problem at all from your experience? I don't know enough to answer that question. Um, I would think... I think that could potentially have an impact. I just don't know to what scale, you know, in terms of that's happening. Um, 
the Rupia, uh, it's definitely in Great South Bay. I've, I've swam through beds of it in the eastern Great South Bay. It's not given as much of a priority because it's shorter, it's thinner, and it's an annual species where the zoster is a perennial. I do think that we should consider it as a part of the submerged aquatic vegetation and habitat because it's, it plays an important role in other places, um, Barnegat Bay, uh, Chesapeake Bay for sure. And as the environment changes in terms of temperature and salinity dynamics probably because of, of the precipitation changes, the habitat for that is likely going to change too. So getting a handle on where it is and, and uh, the role that it plays in the habitat I think would be good for us um, in terms of just management in, in the coastal region. Um, I would actually want to try to get a collaborative survey for uh, Rupia and the Baconic Estuary this coming year because I know it's out there, we just don't know where and how much. Thanks. Okay, Soren, thank you. Thank you.